Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is... Hi. <laughs> My name is Anna Lee Cawthorn. I am the Aging Commission Liaison. On behalf of Tennessee Commission on Aging and Disability, I'd like to welcome you to the second Tennessee for a Lifetime here in Cookville. <laughs> um, I said this is the second one. Our first one was in Bluntville, and then we moved to Cookville, and we're hoping to move this conference across the whole entire state. So we appreciate you coming, and um, I hope that you'll be able to um, get a lot out of this today. Um, a special welcome to our online participants, and we're also streaming this to Fairfield Glade. So we can always say a little hello to them. So hello, Fairfield Glade. <laughs> our goal today is to provide information on important topics related to aging. So you were just in the exhibit hall, and um, I hope you'll take advantage of the people who've come here today to provide state and local resources in your uh, Tennessee for a Lifetime packet, there are important numbers and little blurbs about each of those resources. So if you have any more specific questions, please feel free to call them at any time. Um, also, a great resource in the Upper Cumberland area is your local area agency on aging. We partnered with Patty Ray, Linnell Godsey, and um, Holly to provide this conference today. Uh, they are a great resource, uh, lots of information. You can call them at any time for any questions on aging, and if they don't know the answer, they will sure find it for you. Um, so I'm going to introduce Linnell. She's going to come up and tell you a little bit more about the area agency, and then our keynote speaker will speak, and then we'll do a couple housekeeping things, and we'll get started. So Linnell? Anna Lee, good morning. And thank you for choosing to spend part of your Saturday with us. Um, we're very excited that the Tennessee Commission on Aging and Disability chose Cookville for the second event, and we're so pleased that you took time out to come learn about the different aging topics and what we have here in the Upper Cumberland to assist us. Like Anna Lee said, work with the Area Agency on Aging and Disability, which is housed under the Upper Cumberland Development District. We're located here in Cookville, but we cover the 14 Upper Cumberland counties. So everybody in our region, we can assist you. We also have contacts across the state and other districts if you have friends or family that live outside of Upper Cumberland. So we do have a booth in the room in the with the vendor booths, and we would love for you to stop by. We have lots of information that I think you're going to find very, very beneficial. We have information on the 20 senior centers that are located here in the Upper Cumberland. Um, for Putnam County, the Cookville City Senior Center has actually laid their August program calendar on our booth table for you guys to look at. We also have brochures that talk about all the different programs that the area agency has. One of our programs that's gearing up to become very, very busy right now is the SHIP program, the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, comparing Medicare prescription drug plans. Everybody knows open enrollment October the 15th through December the 7th. So please take advantage of all the good resources on the vendor booths. We hope you enjoy your um, topics that you choose to go to. And at this time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Coach Watson Brown. He was raised right here in Cookville, Tennessee. He was a talented baseball, football, basketball player at Cookville High School. He signed with Vanderbilt out of high school and was a standout quarterback. Coach Brown took the helm of the Golden Eagle program in 2007. The veteran coach has used an even-tempered approach to teach his players and his staff. The 2015 season will be his ninth season with TTU. We are so excited to have Coach Brown as our speaker, and we've had the pleasure in the past to work with his mother with some of our Medicare programs. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Coach Watson Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when Anna called me, I said, well, I guess I am qualified. I'm, I just turned 65. Um, 
I'm walking around limping right now with a sore knee, so I guess I can I can give you a lot of different things. I hurt my knee about a week ago. Um, we were out on the practice field and in a little camp about uh, last week, and I uh, I guess a week after I injured a knee that I'd hurt when I was in college, and I had shorts on. We we're walking around. One of the high school coaches came up to me and says, "My gosh, coach, that's a rough looking leg you got there with those scars and that knee." And he said. What are you doing with that thing? And I said, he said, how'd you hurt it? And I said, well, the scar on the right was the University of Alabama. The scar in the middle was the University of Georgia. And the scar on the left was the University of Tennessee. So three different ones, three different ones got me. Um, I thought what I'd do is just, just give you a little bit of kind of, I started very young. I started coaching when I was 22 years old. I, I planned on being a professional baseball or football player like, like all of us do. Uh, got injured with this knee in my junior year and I was playing baseball and football at Vanderbilt and uh, um, went, to, went to school to play ball. Uh, not sure I went to school to get a degree at the time I went anyway. Uh, and after I got hurt, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, whatever. It just, I really went from everything, everything had been unbelievably easy for me uh, to all of a sudden, what in the world am I going to do? Um, thank goodness uh, my coach, uh, the coach that came into Vanderbilt at the time was Steve Sloan, who had recruited me to go to Alabama. And he kept me on as a, uh, a graduate assistant, and I fell in love with that. My brother Mac always wanted to coach. Uh, now, we, we, hadn't, we didn't have much chance. Uh, my granddad started football at Cooper High School and was the coach till the 60s, started it in the 20s. And so I'm on the sidelines at Cooper High School every Friday night with his players, and what a great man he was. And, uh, man, I just learned so much and didn't even know I was learning when I was 8, 9, 10 years old. And on Saturday nights, Coach Tucker was the head coach here at Tennessee Tech. Coach Tucker and my dad were roommates in college here at Tech. And his son, Kevin, and I are the same age, and we're just still brothers today. We were captains of the high school team together. So on Saturday night, I'm standing next to Kevin at 8, 9, 10 years old on the tech sideline. So I guess I had no chance but uh, to end up in this business. But sure, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And, and uh, so I did it for a year, fell in love, married, uh, uh, met a lady in July, married her in February. You don't do that much anymore. Uh, she, I was 22. She was 19. She was young enough to not know any better. And, uh, and we've been married now 43 years. And uh, somebody says six months isn't long enough. Well, six months was long enough for us. And uh, 22, I said, Brenda, I said, I think I want to get into this crazy business. Are you okay with it? And she's been a great coach's wife. And so I'm walking down the hallway to see Steve Sloan. And just to say, will you help me? He sticks his head out the door to show you how the good Lord's taking care of me. Sticks his head out the door and said, I just got a call from Pat Dye who was an assistant at Alabama at the time. He just got the East Carolina job. He needs a quarterback coach. Are you interested? I'm walking straight down the hallway to tell Coach Sloan I want to get into coaching. I said, yes, I am. I got in a car that right then, drove to, Green, uh, drove to uh, Tuscaloosa, where he was still coaching at the time. He offers me the job, and 43 years later now, uh, I'm, I'm still in this crazy business. Um, I was a head coach at 28, and uh, that wasn't real smart. Uh, I think that is one thing we do when we're young. We, we do make a few uh, crazy mistakes. And uh, my, my second head job, I, I was at the University of Cincinnati, and then I left University of Cincinnati at 32, I guess. I moved twice quick to go to Rice University in Houston, Texas. And uh, um, another great move by me, I take over a program that's lost 36 straight conference games. So the hero that I am, I'm going to go in and change it. And so, uh, yeah, we really changed it quick. We went 1-10 in, in the first year. And uh, we, we beat Lamar 28-27. to 27. The, uh, the, the, the conference loss string went on to my second year there. But there's a couple of stories I'll quickly tell you about that, and then I'll, I'll get on down here. But uh, we're at Rice, and we've, like I say, we've lost 36 straight conference games when we get there. We, we've got 53 total players on the team. You could have 85. And uh, so we're not very good, to say the least. And we, we go to Arkansas in about our fourth game, and uh, we play them really good. It was like a moral victory for us. I think we lost 24 to 20, and our kids are excited in the locker room. We're about to get there now. 
we get back from uh, from Fayetteville at about uh, four in the morning, and I, we fly into Houston Hobby Airport there, and, and uh, we're on a, we're on our charter. Get off the plane and get on our buses and try to get out the gate. The gates are all locked. We can't even get out of the uh, out of the airport. A, 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 a drunk guy, just to be very honest, was outside the gate, sitting in the street, comes and punches a button to get us out. We head back to, to the campus at Rice. I get in my little, I've got a little RX-7 sports car that they gave me to drive. Still got on my Rice outfit and my coaching stuff. And so I start down the Southwest Freeway to go, to go home. All of a sudden, hear the blue lights and pull me over. And a uh, uh, guy, I guess I'm speeding or whatever, and he asked for my driver's license, and I hand it to him. And thank goodness I've still got a rice football in my travel bag next to me. And he starts, he's writing me a ticket, and he starts looking at it, and he says, Watson Brown on there, and he looks at Rice. And you're that new coach at Rice, aren't you? And I said, uh, yes, sir, I am. And to show you not all bad things happen from losing, he rips that ticket up, and he says, buddy, you got enough problems right now. You don't need it. <laughs> True story. So sometimes not all bad things come from losing. I, I'd rather go about it a different way. One more story about Rice, and I, I love this story. And this kid I'm going to tell you about now is still a very good friend of mine and, and means a lot to me. We're playing SMU. Now, if you guys remember when SMU was really good and then they went on probation and shut the program down, well, this was the year before. They were ranked second in the country. To say the least, this is our first year at Rice. We're not very good. So here we go. We're going to fly to Irvin, Texas in Cowboy Stadium and play SMU. We won one game, no conference games. Well, we had played Texas a the week before. We had four quarterbacks, excuse me, three quarterbacks on the team. Three. Well, the third one got hurt against Texas a and So now we're down. Now we're not in there on Sunday trying to decide what our game plans are going to be getting ready to play SMU. We're saying, Who's going to play quarterback? We don't even have a quarterback. So I truly get the media guide out, and I look through it, and I've signed a freshman named Quintus Roper. You look his name up from Dallas, Texas. Quintus played quarterback as a junior in high school. Didn't even play it as a senior. Was a quarterback as a junior. He's all I have. Now, these Rice kids are pretty sharp kids. So I bring Quintus over on a Sunday night into my office, and as soon as he turns the corner, he's saying, no, coach, I'm not going to play quarterback. I say, you want to keep your scholarship. You're all I got. You've got to play quarterback. So we practice on Tuesday, on Wednesday it rains, and on Thursday it rains. We have no indoor facility of any kind. So he gets one practice, and he has to get on the plane, and now he's the quarterback on the first play of the game against SMU. So we go out there, we hand the ball off. We make two, or th two first downs, I think it was, in a row. I get bored, say it's time to throw a pass. So Quintus drops back, his first pass goes right to an SMU guy, intercepts. So I put, he's coming over to the sidelines, great coaching that I did. I put my arm around him and I say, Quintus, throw it to our guys, not theirs. <laughs> he said, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. He goes back out. Another first down or two. The game's still close. I don't know how. Maybe SMU had something on the game, but it's still a good game at this point. He call, I call his second college pass. True story. Intercepted. Two passes, two interceptions. Now I'm steaming. I'm just absolutely steaming at this point, and blah, 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 blah. I won't say exactly what I said. And again, throw it to our guys, not theirs. He walks away from it. We finish the half. The score is 0-0. Zero, zero. So we get at the half, we're playing the second-ranked team in the country. I said, guys, I'm talking to my coaches. I said, guys, we got a chance to knock off the second-ranked team in the country. Who do y'all think we should play? By the way, we finished the second quarter with a hurt guy, and all he did is hand the ball off. He couldn't even move a lick. They all 100% put Quintus back in the game. Well, we go out. First series of the third quarter, we drive it past midfield. Quintus' third college pass. You know what's going to happen. Drops back. This one looks like it could go end over end. I mean, it's floating up. It looked like a punt to me. The guy could have fair caught it. Well, the free safety picks it off, and here he goes. He starts down the right sidelines right by me, and he's going in for a touchdown. Last guy between him and the goes, Quintus, who was a starting defensive back as a freshman for me. He misses the tackle. Guy goes in and scores 7 nothing. 
well, I am living. And Quintus, I, 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 I said, son, what did I tell you? Throw it to our guys, not theirs. This little kid, he's about 5'11", he looks me dead in the eye with this little smirky smile, and he says, coach, their guys are the only ones open. I go, true story. I started giggling. I just thought there's nothing I could do at that point. I mean, I hugged him. We got beat 42 to 7. Our seven points in the game was an interception. We ran back for a touchdown. We had to finish the year with Quintus. Played with him the next year, and then I left and went to Vanderbilt as head coach from there. Quintus ended up making second team all Southwest Conference's quarterback his senior year. So it's, it's a great story. It, it, it's, it's a true story, and sometimes we just uh, we don't give kids enough credit. Uh, you know, we do a lot of things when we're young, and I think we all have a bad habit of, of going back and think about what we could redo. Lord knows there's a lot I could redo from, from 28 as a head coach to 65. Now I'm still coaching. Um, uh, while we were in Houston, uh, if you all remember the movie The Natural, uh, you, but guys probably don't know if the ladies watched it or not, but it's a baseball movie and Robert Redford was in it. It's a great movie. And I remember watching it at Houston and the lady, his wife at the end, going to be wife at the end, he's in the hospital if you remember and she makes a quote while he's in the bed right before he goes to, to help his team win the championship the next day, gets out of bed, and she says, we live two lives, the life we learn from and the life we live after. And I would say we all could uh, relate to that because we've all made so many mistakes. Uh, maybe one of the worst things we try to do is to think too much about going back. Uh, my wife always, I'll go back and say, boy, Brenda, I said... Uh, wouldn't you love to be 21 again? Now, she's smarter than me. She says, nope, I don't want to be 21 again. Maybe 50, maybe 40, but don't put me back at 21. I'm not sure I can handle today's 21 over when I was coming through as, as 21. I think there's a lot of positives um, in, in all professions from getting older and still working. I do. I think one of the biggest ones is experience. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm a better football coach today than I was when I started at head coach at 28 years old. I think experience is, is, is something that you, you've just got to gain, and, and time does that. Nothing else will give you experience at any job that we're all doing if, if you guys are, and ladies are still working. And uh, that is the plus of being 65. That is my biggest plus, in my opinion. But you can take that to me too far. Uh, you, you can, to me, if you, if you go in now, with I've got young guys on my staff, and, and you go in now, and, and this is the way we're going to do it, is a mistake. I think that just because I've done it a bunch of years doesn't make it the right way to do it. And as, even in my profession, the, the game that I coach has changed dramatically since I was 28 till I'm 65, dramatically. And so I think I've had to learn to be patient and listen to these younger guys some and get their ideas and opinions. And, and I've, I've been with older guys that I've worked for, and I think sometimes I look back and too hard-headed, we're going to do it this way, this is the way we've always done it. And I think any of our professions, we could say that. I think it's important um, in, when you're the boss to keep younger people around you and, and not just... Uh, not just keep all my age people, because there's no doubt. People say this, they ask me all the time, is the kid different? Is the kid different today than he was when you started? Honestly, not. They're really not. They're all still selfish. They all still want the ball all the time. They're all great kids. Uh, the difference, though, is the media outlets, the social ways that is I didn't deal with when I was coming through. I can remember I committed to go to Alabama out of high school, and two weeks later I changed my mind and went to Vanderbilt. Lo and behold, if you do that today, the social media's got that all the way through. Nobody knew I'd even committed to, to Alabama and then went to Vanderbilt. What these kids deal with today is so different, these young kids, than what I dealt with coming up through the ranks. Um, 
The other thing I would say that I've been very lucky with, and I tell all of you, even today, I would take everybody's in here 50 or older, make sure you love what you do. Uh, if you don't, find something else you do. Uh, life's too short just to work for a dollar. I know we all got to eat. It's very important to us. And as we get older, we do have to eat. But I've been very lucky. I say it all the time. I've never worked a day in my life. Every day I've gotten up, it's been fun. I've lost games. I've won games. Uh, but it's been fun. It still is. A lot of people say, uh, talk to me about retiring. I'll speak about that in just a second. But uh, I still love what I do. I, I can't wait till Monday morning to get back up and go into the office and and we start practicing two and a half weeks, even though I'm limping around. I really look forward to, to starting again. Uh, the second thing I'd say to all of us as we, as we do get older, and I wish I'd done a better job of this when I was younger, stay positive. The glass half full or the glass half empty. We can all make it whatever we want it to be. And none of us have everything that we want in our lives. Uh, nothing nothing is, is exactly like we'd want it. Stay positive. Uh, positive keeps us healthy. Negative thoughts... Negative vibes, uh, I think that isn't good for our health. And I know this from now coaching kids when I was more negative when I first started to now, no kid, no human being reacts well to something negative over finding a way to make a positive out of it. So we all, in my opinion, need to work on staying positive the best that we can. I think health becomes an issue as we get older. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, like I am now, I've, I, I'm, I'm dealing with a knee I've dealt with since I was uh, 21 years old, and uh, it's getting worse and worse. And we've got we got to make sure we take care of ourselves in a health way, and take care of our bodies. But also, as we do, as we're going to listen to and you're doing, as I'm doing now, just turned 65 in April. I've just signed up for Medicare myself. That was an experience. I had to have about five people get me through that one. Uh, Signing up for Social Security, first of all, it wasn't good for my ego, but I did, I, I've, I've done it and had to have help through that one. Uh, uh, to say the least, at the least, I'm not a computer whiz, uh, but I think it's important that we take care of ourselves. And uh, one thing I've learned as I've gotten older, you don't heal as quick. And we all need to slow down and not try to get back to what we're doing before it's time to get back to what we're doing. And I'm bad about that. Probably need to be up here right now with a pair of crutches. I'm not going to walk around with a pair of crutches. But I have learned through the years, we do heal much slower. And uh, I, th I think that the other thing is we, we need to know what our bodies can handle as we, as we keep working. And whether you're working retired or you're still working a job, you got to know what you can handle. And, and don't overdo it because, folks, health is the most important thing we got. And you don't think that, lose your health. And uh, it, it, it is. I, I've watched my mom and dad go very, very quickly from different, different things. And, uh, and you I took my mom and dad for granted for so many years. And then all of a sudden they're gone and they weren't there to where I could be with them as much and do all the things. And, and health took both of my parents from me. And uh, so we all need to take care of ourselves. Uh, sleep is very important. I'm not very good at that. We all got to find a way to sleep and it needs to be natural sleep. Uh, in my business, and my wife can tell you, she knows when the season's starting because I'm in the bed scrambling around and rolling around and not sleeping near as good, and she'll say, yep, it's about time for football season to start again. Monday and Tuesday, I don't sleep worth a flip. By Thursday and Friday, I sleep like a baby. So we all have to deal with the, with the ways that we, we do. I think the biggest thing that we all deal with to me that I've dealt with is stress. Stress, stress is a killer, and uh, if, if learning how to handle stress better is not an easy thing to do. I've gotten better with age. Age has helped me with stress. I'm going to tell you, when I was young, uh, it was unbelievable. I, I, uh, C.M. Newton, who was the basketball coach at Vanderbilt while I was, when I was the football coach at Vanderbilt, used to say, don't fret over things you can't control, and he is absolutely right. How much do we all sit around and get upset over something we have absolutely no control of? And uh, I've tried my best to learn that one. It's still hard, even with my own children. It, it is still a hard thing to do. I've got a thing here that, that uh, I, we've studied a little bit. And it talks about anxiety, and that anxiety really is what creates stress. 
and it says 92% of the things we get anxious about, we worry about, never happen. 92% of the things we worry about never come true, never happen. Boy, that's a lot of worry, isn't it? That's a lot of time to spend worrying. They say we also spend 30% of our time thinking about the past. I know I do that. I'd say not a good thing to do and think of it in a negative way. Boy, I wish I'd have done this. Boy, I wish I'd have done that. And then they say another 12%, 12 to 15%, we sit around worrying about what other people think about us. Now, in my profession, that, that happens a bunch. But we really all should not care about what somebody thinks about us. We live the life the way we want to live it. We shouldn't worry about it. And so in the bottom line, the person said 8% of the things you worry about, you stress over, truly end up happening. Uh, I, think, I think that's a pretty neat thing. Retirement to me, uh, it's getting close. There's no doubt about it. I'm having to think about it now. I think there's a lot of things we got to look at. we got to look at our financial piece. I didn't really start studying that until I was probably mid to late 40s. I was lucky. I was always in a state retirement system. Uh, I spent some of that as I would travel around, but then stayed at UAB for 13 years and fell into a great, great retirement plan that I'm already double dipping and drawing uh, at this point. Uh, we all have to take care of ourselves financially as we get older. And, uh, uh, and as I said, I think making sure financially, in the health ways financially, we've taken care of ourselves is I'm still on, of course, Blue Cross here through Tennessee Tech, but now, now the Medicare piece will start showing up and, and, and different things. We've got, we've got to take care of ourselves financially. I think as we get closer to retirement, we need to do it slowly. Um, people are telling me as I'm talking about it now, people are saying to me, don't just quit cold turkey. Make sure that you're going to do something, and then maybe a little less as you go and a little less as you go. I can see that as I'm getting closer. Uh, I think we all have to have a cause. I don't know if you all feel that way. I think we have to have a cause. We have, to, we have to get up every day to work for something, to enjoy working for something, whether it's making money ourselves still working or if we're just working with a whatever, uh, somebody to help raise cancer, whatever it might, money for cancer. Whatever. We have to have a cause. We have to feel good about what we're doing. And I think the minute we quit doing nothing, we're going to slowly, slowly, physically, mentally, we're, we're going to disappear. Um, People have asked me, why are you still doing this after 43 years? And uh, like I say, I still enjoy it. But the main reason I still do it, my wife makes me. I mean, uh, she, she, we talked about it uh, this week. And uh, she says, no, I, you need to keep going. You need to keep working. And I don't think it's got anything to do with the money. I think it's to keep me out of the house. I really and truthfully do. One of her favorite things to say through all these years, and like I say, this will be our 43rd wedding anniversary, real close. And and people will come up and say, boy, you've you all been together a long time. She says, no, not really. Not really. She says, we, we've had paper saying we're married 43 years, but I've only been married to him 21 of those. He's been gone the other the other 22. And she loves to say that. Of course, that's that's a coach's wife, and that's, that is a lot to be true. I think the main thing that I've learned as, as I've now gotten older, how much more family and friends mean to us. I think when I was younger, and I speak about myself here, I'm not talking about you all, but I'm giving you my thoughts and things that have happened to me. I was in the rat race to be the best I could be and do all the things. I can remember times I'd give anything to go back and be with my children and when I was younger doing certain things that I'm off recruiting or I'm doing whatever I'm supposed to do. And I think as I've gotten older, I realize how important my family was. Getting to come back to Cookwell. I've been gone from Cookwell 40 years. Getting back here and getting my mother for three years before she passed away was just huge. Um, so I, I, I think family, friends, my friends have now become my close friends. And uh, that, that means so much to me. And uh, I wish if I'd done anything any different when I was younger, I would slow down and smell the roses a little more and know, know what the important things were. There were times I could have gotten home. My brother Mac and I came back to Cookville in these 40 years, one night a year. And, and that's not enough. One night a year. We'd come back in the summer, play golf with my mom and dad in the morning and, or the afternoon, spend the night, play golf the next morning. We'd fly out and go. One night a year. And uh, I, just, I just regret that so much. And, and now I look for times to be with friends, with family. And to do all that, just just having a, I think when we get older, we do know how to balance life better. 
It's something we just do a better job of, and, and I, I did a poor job. The negative that I've dealt with, I think, as I've gotten older is death. And uh, as, as I get older, friends are dying around me. Uh, family is dying around me. We, we buried my, my wife's dad yesterday, and he was 89. And uh, just losing so many friends, and as you're sitting there, you, you feel real bad for your family, your friends, and people who have died, but you also start thinking about yourself a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm getting close. I'm getting on up there now. And uh, I just think that's a, that's a thing we all have to deal with. And this, the, the way that I deal with it, I'm just, I have such a strong faith that there's a better place that we're going. And uh, that's what I always go back to as I sit there yesterday. And uh, as, as I had tears in my eyes, because honestly, he was my second dad. I've been very lucky in that way. And, and uh, sitting there thinking to myself, he's already in a better place. We're the ones hurting the ones here on earth that are hurting now. And, uh, but we do. We start dealing, dealing with death a lot more. I think in a, in a synopsis, I think that we all just, we got to feel good about ourselves. We have to feel good about what we do. It's, 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 it, it's not the material things. It's, it's, it's us and our lives and ourselves and proud to be who we are, proud to be uh, what we've done and, and, and to understand we've, we've all made mistakes as we've grown older. And uh, um, there, there's a, a statement here that um, I go by, I like to read this a lot. It says, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. And the things that we've done with what we have, and, if we, and we're not finished yet. There's still a lot we can do, and we should be working to do that. Uh, my grandmother gave me a little card when I was 12. And she told me then, and I had no idea what the heck she's talking about. She told me then, she says, you need to go by this the rest of your life. Because when you get on up, you're going to look back at this and understand what this means. So I carried it in my wallet till it just where I couldn't read it anymore. But, but I've, I've got it in a little frame that I got it uh, fixed up in a little frame. And, it's, and I've, I've got it uh, at our home. And it says, what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. And uh, as I've gotten older, I totally understand what that means. Uh, it's not how big a house we got or how many cars we got. or that's, That isn't what matters. What matters is what we do with our lives and what we give back. The good Lord gave us all pluses and minuses, and we've had to deal with them the best we can. Nobody's perfect. There's only one man that's ever lived on this earth, earth that's perfect, and that was Jesus Christ. And... Uh, but we all have to take what he gave us and make something out of it. And until they put us in that grave and put us away, we need to be working toward that at all times. Easy to say, not always easy to do. But I think if we could go by that, it would be good. I hope I've given you something. Good luck to all of you. I see a lot of faces that look about as old as me. Uh, I don't know what happened from 35 to 65. It went fast. It went fast. It must have been fun because it went so fast I can't even remember. And one of my coaches the other day just turned 42. And I said, I don't remember 42. I don't even know where I was when I was 42. And, uh, but yet there's still a lot left to do. And let's all keep our heads up and take care of ourselves and, and be positive and live the best life we can live. Thank you all very much.